Hi, Brandon. You're on mute. Hey, I'm Oh, geez. There we go. I think I need to move off of a uh, last pass. It, it stopped really working for me. I'm going to that camera. Hang on a second. Last pass? Like the password manager? Yeah, yeah. I don't know why the plug the the extension stopped really working for me, and so, like, it it's just super annoying. So now I need to go into the actual like web console, look for my password, copy it, paste it in. Uh, password for everything. So much. <laughs> So I know Parth is is so he's going to be flying out to uh, um, Black Hat, so he won't be making it today. Uh, trying to stop his ID badge getting hacked. In. Yeah, yeah, he's he's uh, I, pretty much all of them are like, I think I should not connect to any Wi-Fi, any you know, so I won't be at any meetings uh, <laughs> this week. Yeah, but my my CDF team when we were back at doing the CDF, we had all internal infrastructure. We brought our own routers, we brought our own internet, and all that. Hello. Hello. Thanks for the link, Ben. Like you want to pick up? Yeah, sure. Um, so just uh, as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. It'll be uploaded to LFX uh, a little bit after the the, the end of the meeting. Um, and uh, your your attendance is an agreement to abide by the OpenSSF code of conduct. And uh, there's an antitrust policy notice in the meeting notes. Um, you know. Uh, just don't participate in any anti-competitive behavior and yada yada. Um, the the note in there says it better than I could. Um, cool. So now, uh, I think uh, so. I know Parth is not going to be here because he's going to be he's at um, he's going he's heading out to uh, a Black Hat, um, but. Uh, yeah, I guess we can start going through the list. Um, does I, I'm not sure who wants to take what topic here. <laughs> um, so well, it looks like we don't have anyone. So, open interfaces. 
Um, there is so I added one item on the kind of pop juicy journeys kind of came up from um conversations from last week around one point and I think one of the big unknowns around one point was like do we like what are the supported kind of user journeys we wanna we wanna have. Um, and I think that was unclear and that warranted some additional uh, research. And so I worked with Ben and Abhishek um, to Abhishek in this call <laughs> in, uh, to kind of work out a uh, kind of a process to kind of uh, work with users and figure out what journeys they want. Um, and so I wanted to share and discuss that a little bit easier. Sure. Let's see what I can share with the screen. I may actually. So I suppose I can then also talk a bit about the um, Postgres and Ant yep. stuff, since that's my my baby. Um, I was, I've had a look over the past week at how the uh, GraphQL server interacts with, with Postgres. Although the the API, the, the, that Fluent API, we just sort of you know, chain the objects together and whatever, that looks, but it looks like it's talking about a graph. Um, the queries that are built underneath, so are not. It is very classic, third normal form, join and join and join and join database. Um, so I've I've been looking at a few ways to to push to push Ant's behavior around on that. Um, in the meantime, I also bumped into some of the facts that uh, Ant is depending on a currently unmaintained Go driver for Postgres. Um, so I went down the rabbit hole of trying to get it to use the currently maintained one. Um, with some success. It, it builds, it runs, but th there's a whole lot of fiddling involved to get it to work. Um, so there's still there's still some work there. I haven't figured out how how big a patch would have to go into Ent to, to change that. Um, but I'm hoping to get it down to sort of 20 lines of, of something that needs to change in Ent. Um, the other the other thing that was on the on the opens, which I, I discussed very, very briefly with Path, I think, was the question of keeping track of changes. You know, what in the in the the data warehousing world we'd call slowly changing dimensions, or you know, soft deletes, or something along those lines. Uh, I'm I'm not sure I quite understand what the target scope of that is. There, there, there are some things that Int does does support there. You know, it supports a soft delete model. Um, it it can be made to partition those off separately so that the volume of data scan changes and all that sort of stuff. But I'm not quite sure I understand the, the requirement for what what Guac needs. Um, would this be a good time to just dive into that? I don't know. That's also another question. Is this yeah. time, or do I need do we need to have a call with someone else at some other yeah. point to talk about? Oh, Jeff. Yeah. Before we get into the delete stuff, I have a question on what you said about the uh, the queries. You said that the queries are not graph queries; they're really just very traditional queries. Um, is that something that? concerns you like it seems like to me like doing something traditionally is actually kind of good because that's how what everybody else has done in the past or is it like those joins that you mentioned that are are hurting performance or are causing issues it's the fact that some of the recursion is happening at the application level not in the database i see okay so there's a whole bunch of that start it get the results back stop it start it overhead involved um, and also a lot of it, I suppose some of this is just born of the, of the fact that a lot of this comes from the GraphQL, that the 
the way the thing interacts with the database which comes from the GraphQL world, a lot of these things are done one at a time rather than in sets. And ultimately, SQL being what it is, databases were really optimized to do the stuff in sets. Thanks. So if I, if I understand what I'm saying is that like right now, it's kind of doing in a, because GraphQL is structured that way, it's doing it in the sense of like, it's trying to say, oh, just get me a little bit of data, uh, have it come back to me and then kind of have multiple round trips and both possible, multiple like, Okay, we'll scan, so in that yeah, I, I, th I think that is it is the way into structure that does that. Okay, but the the the, the matchup between it and GraphQL seems quite natural because GraphQL also tends GraphQL APIs tend to be built that way. As well. mm, okay. So yeah, I'm I'm looking at a few a few options there. Um, It doesn't look like getting int to behave is that great an option, but we'll see. Yeah, I think one of the questions, and I think Marco, Marco was on this thing where it's like, oh yeah, you know, like ingestion and everything that goes to the model is just it's going to end. But then, like in the REST API, uh, surface. The direct Postgres database, so like queries could be, um, like the ingestion could still be kind of within the graph structure, but like queries could be that you just know, two joins against, uh, against the table for a few well-lit well queries. Yeah, the 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 joins are not that big an issue. You know, for instance, that that example that pulled back in S bomb um, isn't too bad. But the the tree traversal stuff that goes and says, you know, find me all of and just runs runs down until it runs out of branch. That that is recursing at, at the application level. Right. And that that's just not great. You know, most a lot of that data should never come back to the application. Um, do you need any more contacts around some of those queries? So, or do you, do you, do you have that? Um, I think, I think the documentation what the API is trying to do makes sense to me. Oh. Uh, I, I, I think I, I understand what an SBOM is supposed to be, and the, the, the GraphQL API at least seems to represent that quite well. But yeah, um, the way it's ending up at the database is a little cruel to the database. I'm, I'm excited to hear, hear what's cooking there. And I, I guess uh, a question is, do you think this is, and I know you haven't, you know, so I, I know that this is, uh, you haven't dived in super deep yet into to guac it, like the GraphQL and everything else. Do you think this is just a pattern that is like looking at Ent and and GraphQL, that is just like, could this be fixed and the GraphQL will still work? Or do you think that like, hey, if you really wanted to make this efficient, you don't know if GraphQL would be able to handle it? So I think GraphQL can. I'm I'm not sure about some of the um, conventions around how GraphQL is used. Yeah, um, the, the the APIs seem to be by convention atomic rather than set based, and I had I had this conversation in fact with uh, with somebody on the uh, the OpenSSF um, Slack, um, Narsa, about you know, so, so some of the API stuff, and you know just that it it seems. It seems that some of these things could be done far more efficiently in sets. So I, I, I don't know who, whose thing some of that API design is, but there's a, another whole set of questions there. Okay. 
Yeah, I think the GraphQL API that we designed was more on Neo4j and uh, Arango, but now that we moved more towards SQL, that doesn't really work that the same way, and we might need to squash some resolvers and do everything in just one. Or, or at least give them the option of having multiple. Yeah. Rather than always being a point query, yeah. Because uh, uh, ultimately, you know, Arango, Neo4j, although they're they're big on relationships, they're still key value stores in many ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, but yeah, it's just that the way we designed the Go interface and then that calls into the, its own resolver, that will probably need to, to completely change. So it will be a bigger refactor. Okay, right. Um, I don't want to be the guy suggesting that, but we'll <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> well, well, I, 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 so for what it's worth, I don't think uh, any of us are opposed to the refactor. I think the thing that we want is, because um, I, uh, none of us are as I think experienced in 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 database stuff as you are. What we didn't want to do was try like 12 different refactors and not know which thing is is right like if you have a good understanding of like hey i really think that if you took this approach this is probably would would get much better performance um we'd probably take that opinion <laughs> just to be clear yeah I, th I, I think the thing is just we don't you know the thing that we've run into in the past is we don't know which of these things would at least be like you don't have to be obviously we're not asking you to know, see the future and know exactly if whether or not it would be better but like if you say yeah it's probably going to be a lot better because of these reasons great now we know that uh if it's going to be like you know a couple of weeks to refactor that's fine um we've just run into in the past because we're still not uh experts at this is that we've run into a th few things where we've done a couple of refactors and been like oh nope didn't work because we didn't realize yeah mm -hmm. so i think um On Slack, there there is definitely some upside to doing some of the stuff in bulk. It looks like quite a lot. Of the same request one after each other. Um, hmm. I, I think we we just was it me. Uh, uh, I think that was me. Everyone else's face froze. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um, I, I I think it, it looks from some of the discussion on Slack like it, it's a fairly common pattern that. A lot of the same request happens, you know, one after each other. Uh, but I think, you know, if uh, if Brandon's chasing a um, sort of a so what would all the other users in the world look look to these APIs for kind of question? Um, I I can get involved in some of that, and that'll that'll give us a, a more clear answer at the end of it all. Awesome. Um, do you want to chat a little bit on the soft deletes? Well, I don't know. I don't know who who else has what to discuss. Um, no hands raised, so I think we can move to that. Um, so I'll I'll chat about what I know, and and others can can chime in on that. Um. So I think we right now we have two categories of of uh, deletes or soft deletes that we want to do. One of it is you know, every time a um, ingestion is done on a predicate, it comes with a timestamp. Um, some of these times, uh, some of these predicates like vulnerability scans, you know, they are done daily. Um, at a certain point, you know, I'm not going to care about the scan that happened three months ago because you know, all the GPs will be out of date anyway. Sure. Uh, so for certain predicates, we want to be able to say like, you know, you know, I don't care about them within the query set that I'm, uh, I'm trying to ask for. Um, and, you know, basically we can have like the infinite growing that I think I think some people can can archive it. Some people they they, they don't want to. Uh, some users don't want to have that storage requirement. Uh, 
So I think that's one of it. You know, the same thing with some users have several comments on like Build Horizon. You know, I'm only uh, Yahoo that we talked about was like saying that yeah, they only care about the last their retention policy the last nine months or so of something that's like a little thing. Uh, so that's one of the use cases. Um, the other one we have, which is not, I wouldn't, um, it's more like a enter in error type situation where mm -hmm. um, I've done, I accidentally certified something bad. Uh, I want to reboot the certification on that. Um, you know, this is, I think we wouldn't be the common path. Um, I think at least like the way that we think about attestations and the information of the graph database is that you know sometimes the data quality isn't that great or well, sometimes you know what you didn't know uh, yesterday results in, in an attestation which is not usable today and that's fine uh, this is more of like oh yeah you know like had a typo and really I want to do a revocation on something something that I, I put in the database. Um, and that's where the second one comes in, where it's like, I, I don't, I actually don't want any other results to to be able to use that bad data. Yeah, and, and obviously then that is, that is something you want recorded, that someone, yeah. and someone that. Um, walked away from the attestation. Yes, yes, the um, repudiation problem, yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah, but yeah. So, so, so I mean, the, the whole the time based thing is quite easy to get and to abstract for you. Um, there's there, there's there, there, there is support for something like the slowly changing dimension idea in in end. Um, the the revocations, I'll, I'll, have a, I'll have a look at. Um, how do, do you know how this will kind of, is it kind of a policy on the database that we say, okay, anything that's um, based on this particular like, retention policy that we soft use it, but then like how do we service it in the query? To say whether, uh, let's say, you know, touch for so another, a, another so the, two, the two options for it. Um, um, one of them is just to create a partitioning policy based on active and soft deleted. And then the application goes and soft deletes stuff. Um, yeah, so, so, so that's the the more basic physical structure so you don't end up with the the query scanning stuff that's being soft deleted. Now in the case of the um the uh revoked attestations, there's not going to be a big issue. We're hoping it's going to be the minority of data. Um you can very quickly get to a point on time-based expiry where the majority of your data is no longer valid. Um and and that then the, the partitioning plan becomes a lot more important. Um, I can also see a, a, a use case there. Um, you were describing, I think it was Yahoo you were saying, who want a certain time back. And you know, the, the idea that people may want to query based on how far back did we. When, you know, if we if we look at the past six months, do we see any issues here? If we look at the past nine, do we see any issues? That that sounds to me like a basis for time-based partitioning. That, that some of these things will, will be put into time buckets. Um, and yeah, there, there are there are extensions to Postgres uh, Partner, for instance, that manage the creation of new partitions. And uh, you know, potentially, if you're being very, very focused about some of your timelines, aggregating some of them later. You know, we, 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 um, there, there's some people who, particularly in the finance field, care just about yesterday's data. And then they care differently about this month's data and then a whole lot less about anything before that. So you end up smashing together all the month partitions once the month's over. And Parkman does all of that sort of all, all that sort of stuff for you. There's a 
it's configurable and goes and does the work for you. So yeah, I think they're, they're probably two two different approaches there. Yeah. Thanks for keeping the, the heartbeats on the, the video going there with the, the coffee cup, Jeff. Just in case we wonder if it's, wonder if it's frozen. <laughs> cool. Uh, right well, cool. That's all I have to say at the moment on the, the database. Awesome. Thanks, Alistair. That's what's uh, very good discussion. Um, so I thought maybe we can move on to the usage journey that uh, Ben Abishai can add this on. Let me share my screen. Can we see my screen? Is that good? Yeah, it looks good to me. Okay. Um, so I think in general, what we ended up with is you know a, a two-step process into trying to figure out you know one what do people think about Guam when they look at it, you know, before actually using it and trying to do a POC, um, what do they think they are going to get out of Guam? And, you know, what are kind of like the problems that are trying to solve with Guam? And then we, we kind of put this in a two part with after kind of having the first meeting and finding more about that, um, you know, some of the, the, the users that we will talk to would then go ahead to try and do this with their own organization, right? So like spend, one or two engineering weeks to say like, let me try and use Guap and, and see how far I get. And uh, that will be kind of like the second interview that, that we have, which is getting the user feedback on, you know, how was your actual experience using Guap, uh, what kind of like the speed bumps that, that we ran into. Um, and, you know, do you think you'd be using Guap? You know, what are the next steps? You know, what, what do you think we can do better? Um, so um, I think I'm gonna just do a read through. Um, does anyone have any questions um, before that? Okay. Um, I can't see hands, so if you have a hand up, just let's talk. Um, so the first the first one that, that we talked about is kind of like user journeys. Um, and the idea here is like we're gonna start with a 30 minute interview on um, the people that we're gonna interviewing, you know, the assumption is if they've read the Guap landing page, they're not really current power users of Guap, right? So I think a lot of the current partners that we're already working with then know Guap inside out. I don't think they fall into this category. Um, and, you know, optionally they could have tried a few demos and you know, kind of see what Guap is. So general cursory, like you kind of spend maybe like 15 minutes um, on, on Guac, you know, what are your first thoughts on that? Um, so the questions that, that we kind of talked about is like, you know, we will interview a user, ask them what do you think Guac is? Um, you know, also um, what does software supply chain mean to you? So. Uh, I think Ben brought this up, which I think is really good in terms of like, maybe like your framing on software supply chain may be totally different from what we're thinking. Uh, and so that will give us a lot of context to uh, the answers that we provide after. Um, and you know, what would you want to achieve with Guac? What kind of problems are you solving? Um, and so these are more like, oh, what is the problem? What's the context? And then the second part of this is going to kind of add them a little bit more like on the, on the technical level, you know, what do you have available to you? What are the, the parameters that, that go into the problem today? 
and this goes into you know how melody that do you have um where do you get the made it melody that how much of this is, is you generating um you know is it s forms is it salsa which types of um formats is it uh, are you using sif are you using you know turn are you using hot tooling are you using and basically kind of understand a little bit more the landscape of where the data is coming from and to help us narrow down on like areas that we, we can focus on. Um, together that, you know, size of your metadata and also like integration points and how people are getting metadata. Um, the hope at the end of the interview is to, to ask the user, you know, are you having organization um, with this? Let's try this out and I think uh, Abhishek um, is, is uh, willing to kind of have this Goombug be a, a our first customer here uh, with the POC. Um, and, you know, after that, where they spend about an engineer week or, or two maybe on trying to integrate Quark, um, we have another that you may interview. Uh, we want to understand kind of like what the user experience is. So speed bumps, anything that they didn't expect, which was good. Um, and also whether, you know, did their understanding of the Quark project change um, from reading that, you know, one that initial first 15 minutes of Quark versus spending multiple hours of Quark, maybe like, are we communicating the right ideas for the project? And also, you know, what the next steps, um, what feature requests or what things would they want to see in Quark? as well as do they want to contribute to Quark or be using it in the organization in the future. Uh, and post the second interview if they're interested you know, and they are actually will be using Quark uh, for a lot with um, in a few months on maybe a, a user case study, um, write a blog post. It's a problem I like to collaborate on blog posts. Um, Abhishek and Ben, um, do you have anything to add? Nothing from here. I think you covered it pretty well. Uh, yeah, it looks it looks good from mine. Uh, I just wanted to confirm if we were, do we prefer having an interview or a survey? Because survey, I think, would be easier for my end because I'll be, my internship ends in two weeks. So I think it will be easier to uh, hand it over to someone and ask them to send over the data. So I think a survey would be easier. Um, and also having the legal process of get, having the data accessible outside Bloomberg. I, mean, I think an interview would get us some better like data because we can, then we can ask follow-up questions and clarify things, but uh, a survey would be better than nothing at this point because we don't we, we have nothing so um, if we can get something that at least uh, is progress yeah, sounds good yeah yeah I mean I think one of the things that I didn't really see just a um I, so if you if you scroll up a little bit um Yeah, I guess like one follow up from like the what does supply chain security mean to you is I do think that there is like a little bit of, um, I mean, maybe even continuing to level set a little bit there is like, what does, you know, I, I'd be also interested, like what are folks doing today to um, secure their supply chain, if that makes sense, right? Because like there might be, you know, I, I have a feeling we're going to run into folks who are like, yeah, I'm generating S-bombs or blah, 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 or yeah, I'm just using Dependabot, right? Are you generating an S-bomb? Are you doing this, that? You know, I think that's kind of ties into then the, 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 the next question of, hey, what problems are you solving? And, you know, um, what, what metadata might you have? Um, I have a feeling a lot of the folks are either at the, like, I have, I'm generating a bunch of S-bombs or I have nothing.
it's just good. This is kind of the interpreted, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, ben, um, I mean, I know Ben has done these sorts of things before. Do, do you think that seems reasonable? Yeah, we might want to expand it to exclude like some or include some specific examples, like you said, like, you know, generating SBOM, things like that, um, just to kind of make sure. Can, to kind of make sure people understand the question we're asking. So, you know, like all the things that you that you listed off could be just like a few examples um, to kind of prime the pump. I mean, the other approach too, if we're going to do it as a survey is to list out a bunch of things and say yes or no, or like have people drag them into the, yes, I'm doing this pile. Uh, I just worry that the more questions we add, the, you know, the more drop off we're going to get, um, because that you know, we're asking people to do a survey for free. And so the time that they're willing to give us is very small. Yeah, I do think we also probably should test this, right? And I think like if we're, we're trying to achieve too much, then half an hour or whatever, we have to pick and choose which ones are more useful for us. I mean, this could also probably tie into this question around the supply chain metadata. Um, Um, I put in a few here. Um, yeah, I think feel free to 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 add add to this. I'm not sure whether you have added access. Um, can you check? I can share that with like the old Google group. Um, any other feedback on, on this? Since we were just talking about the question of aging data out, is it is it worth asking when, 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 on the question about how much data they have, how long they keep it for, how at, at what age they think the data would become pointless? Or is that just pushing the thing a bit too long to Ben's point? I think having uh, maybe, like, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, yeah. I mean, I think having one extra like thing there to say, you know, like, cause I think it's just like a follow-up from that of like, how long do you keep this data is 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 valuable. Um, and like, it doesn't have to be, you know, like hyper-specific, I keep it for 30 days or 90, but like, oh yeah, I keep it largely indefinitely or, oh, keep it for a release or whatever, I think would be still useful. Yeah, cool. Um, I added that to this. Uh, I, I think like in the end, we probably want to test the this survey search interview and see how it goes. Uh, and then iterate from that. I, I don't think it's going to be perfect from, from from the onset. So Any other comments? If not, I think we can maybe talk about next steps um, for this, which is probably getting 
one or two people to, to test this out. I lost my zoom in now, so I can <laughs> Uh, is this people at Bloomberg or do you want to test this out before uh, do the survey at Bloomberg? Do the interview at Bloomberg? I, I think it could be. Um, yeah, uh, I think we could. Since, especially since you, you you have like one or two weeks left. Maybe we should, yeah, this should be the best one. Uh, sh sure, I can. I can start it uh, around Wednesday or Thursday. I can start. I can document it and start the process. Then. I'll, I'll share updates and uh, let you know about how it goes. If there are people who we think may be may be interesting to interview, um, should I send the once I've asked them if they're willing to, should I send the details to to you, Brandon, to you, Abhishek? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Cool. Um. So, Abhishek, are, are you going to set something up and then, um, with the the your other colleagues, and then, uh, and you also invite Ben and Ben and me so that we can help and yeah, transcribe and. and yeah, I think at least for the first interview, that would be helpful uh, to get a picture of if I'm uh, going on the right track. So uh, I'll invite you for the first one, for sure, at least. Um, yeah, I guess that's it for the business of doing this one. We have 15 minutes left. Let me look at the that. Yeah, I added one thing. Um, I think we were going to discuss versioning of the REST API today, um, or at least we touched on it last week. Um, I, I think the question there is um, how to version it uh, in uh, uh, with reference to the REST um, to the GraphQL API, um, and I, I guess the like the overall Guac version. Um, my assumption is that the like the release versions will be that's going to like correspond to the GraphQL API version, um, and I, then I think it makes sense to. Keep the version of the REST API um, in sync with um, with that version. Like have it be the same one. Um, another option would be to version it separately um, and then like maintain some type of mapping. Um, I think it's simpler to just keep it together. Um, and if there is a Say if we add an endpoint um, to the REST API, we can bump the minor version of of, of Guac overall, um, cut a new release, um, and then the like the the clients of the REST of the so the REST API, like the the whoever's running that, can upgrade um, uh, that binary, but they don't need to change. The rest of Guac because it's a bump in a minor version. Um, but if there's any backwards incompatible changes, um, then that would have to wait until a all new uh, major version upgrade. That does sound like what a lot of the database engines do for their um, binary protocols. You can only you can only do something backward incompatible 
on a, on a major version. But for long-lived projects, they do tend to version the protocol separately. So you know, Postgres is now on version 17 and is on Y protocol version 3. Well, I mean, the unique thing that the REST API has is the ability to put the version in the path. So we could always have V1, like let's say, you know, when we release Quark uh, overall project version 1.0, we call the REST API at V1 um, stable. Um, we could always add new endpoints there. We could always add new query parameters, things like that. We could add new fields to the things we return, um, but we couldn't return. We couldn't remove stuff, right? Um, I think we should be able to start v two at any point. We shouldn't need a, a new Guac uh, overall two point release to start v two. We could just add a new v two endpoint, and if we want to change something or do something that's backwards incompatible, we just do it in v two. Um, and then, but V2 would have to start out being like beta or something like that, right? Uh, because so that we could iterate on it before we call that stable. Um, I think the thing that we would want to only do on a Quark major release is like remove V1 or remove, you know, um, but, you know, we, we can always add stuff as long as we keep the old thing there and working. Um, and so in that way, it's kind of, you know, we have some freedom to have new new releases but uh, and do things that are backwards compatible as long as we keep the old thing as well. <laughs> um, but, you know, and, and there and we don't have to tie ourselves to the main Guac releases. And sure, we can we can bump the Guac minor version when we add new stuff, new features to the REST API. That's fine. Um, the thing that isn't very clear to me that I don't have figured out is how do we mark a, a version as beta or not stable yet? So like if we do want to do a V2 and may, say it's beta, we're, we're still iterating on it. Like how do we do that within the, the, the scope of like the Guac releases? I think Brandon was first. Um, yeah, I mean, um... Marco, if you want to respond to this, this comment first, my mind's on a different um, Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think I was going to ask about what, what you just said, how um, if, if we maintain a new channel, um, like a V2 channel, we can make changes there that are backwards incompatible with V1, but not with respect to that channel itself. Um, well, at some point, like when you're developing it, you want to be able to make backwards incompatible changes in V2 before you say like, hey, this is something people should use. Yeah, so, That's, so yeah. I think we can just maintain a like an alpha or a beta channel. Um, yeah. Not necessarily like any one version. Um, and then the... Then I, I think you, like you said, upgrading to a new major version is... Um, that can be formalized as the API for the new um, for the new major version. Yeah, I think one of the 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 related to this, I think one other question is like, do we want to have um, each? each API be version differently versus like, I think the question is, uh, is the interaction pattern that like, I'm going to call this API and then I'm going to use the results from this API to call this API versus like, I mean, am I going to have the versioning of two different APIs because it's separate? Uh, do we need to have that type bundling? Or like here's the V1 API, you should use them together. This is like the more Kubernetes style API, which is like, oh, this like deployment can be V1, but like custom resource definitions can be like alpha. Uh, I think the API should be complete. So um, let's say we have two, two commands and you like to use the output of one for the other. So we'll release both of those in V1, but 
one out of those two, we decide we really hate and we want to redesign. So we do that in alpha, but then when we want to release the new version, when we release V2, we should just release everything in V2 so that eventually we can just deprecate V1. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So usually like in the in the alpha version you would have like the copies of the APIs which uh like you may have like experimental endpoint, but then the old endpoint will still exist, but then you will kinda of copy them over to the alpha. And also I think minor versions can interoperate with each other if it's the same major version. I think this is interesting. Right? I, I I feel like I maybe this is just me, but when I think about B1, B2, REST endpoints, I think about like the OCI, the OCI spec, and it's always just one major, it's just major version. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Wow. Yeah, I think minor versions probably should. Yeah, yeah I agree. It should be that like, compatible. Um, one point that I think I heard you talk about a little bit, I think there's probably some trickiness that you mentioned the GraphQL endpoint. Uh, I think that goes into like, what is the deployment model that we want to tell customers that like when you're deploying Quark, you have to redeploy all these components in order to be able to, like if, if you replace the ingestion server, um, or you replace the API server, but you don't replace like the, the ingestion server, then, yeah, you know, I don't think it's gonna, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna end up with a working deployment, right? And, uh, you said that that would somehow be linked to the, yeah, I, I think we have to be clear on like, what does it mean? Uh, I don't think the REST API should depend on the GraphQL version. Uh, but it should depend on the deployment of the, the full deployment of the block. Is that make does that make any sense? But it, it does depend on the specific, like it's built with a GraphQL client, right? So. Mm. Right, but I think in this case, um, I think the question is whether we want to support replacing certain components on others, um, which I'm kind of inclined to just say like, no, we don't want to support that. If you want to upgrade one, you, you, up, you have to upgrade all the components. Um, You're saying you don't want to mix and match like the REST API and other Guac components, even if they're on the same GraphQL API version, they may have differences in behavior or functionality. So you want to start to say like Guac should always be updated as a whole unit, even if the GraphQL API didn't change or have a breaking change. I think to a point which makes sense for the deployment. I, I think that's something that we be haven't quite talked about yet, which is like, I feel like everything that runs in kind of like the, the cluster, the, the, so -called the brain, the centralized part of Quark, probably should be closely tied together and stuff that potentially run in, in kind of endpoints like like the clients hmm. probably can be a little bit differently well um, the problem is we've got the ingester inside of guac one <laughs> and that's sometimes run on the client side yeah. i'd be curious to to have sunny chime in on this actually i wonder what the Maybe can see whether he's able to make it.
he's he's still maintaining the helm charge, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, like we've been running. I mean, like we've been make we've been changing the GraphQL API pretty frequently. Like this last change with the um, uh, his dependency, like everything needs to be updated at once. Clearly, there, but if the if the API doesn't change, yeah, that's a good question. Like, what do you know? Are we going to be worried about incompatibilities between the different versions of the pieces, like the ingester and the the other parts. So you're referring to a, an upgrade where the API doesn't change, but it is still backwards incompatible. Well, the API wouldn't be backwards incompatible, right? But what what else in Quark is it going to be? Semantically. Yeah. It might be backwards incompatible. Or just result in behavior that was unexpected. <laughs> Maybe it all runs. <laughs> it all runs, but then you're missing some data that drop. Yeah. That's all. Like I, 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 yeah, I guess like the the upgrade we had to come up with the story of like upgrading clock in a faster. Yeah. Then, yeah. We probably just have to settle on that, and maybe this was a, wouldn't be an issue at all. I mean, I is there a big downside to just saying you need to upgrade everything if the guac major version is increased is bumped no but i think for the minor version there's a question about that brandon was mentioning about the cl like clients and things like that so let's say you upgrade your whole cluster you've got a bunch of um pipelines running like guac one and all of those need to be updated too if if you want to keep everything the same version, but you know, is it okay for there to be some drift there? I I like, think yeah. even go ahead. No, I was just gonna say yeah, like as long as you know the services are gonna be down for like a few seconds, then some may be up in the old version for a few seconds or a few minutes for others upgrading in a few minutes faster. So I think we just need to be Mindful of that uh, by saying that, okay, great, all your state is in the pub sub, pub sub state is running. We remove all the services so that if there's anything that calls into it and it's a failure, um, like you're going to run into failure so long, right? So as long as there's something that's collecting the data while the upgrades happen, which I think for us is the pub sub. No, I, I agree where like I think for most of the the I think for the most of the folks that that we're talking to today, I don't think um it would still be single ownership. So I think asking them to just upgrade everything wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be be yeah. Too much to ask for. Sorry, Marco, do you want to say something? Um, no, I, I mean, I think we, yeah, we will have to ask for that whenever the GraphQL API changes, but if we can offer like smaller changes where they don't have to do that, then I guess that'd be, that'd be nice as well. Yeah. Maybe next time we can kind of do a playbook of what we think upgrading quality is like, um, like all the different components and when we do upgrade. I need to go. You have time as well. Okay. All right. See you later.